<laughs> in Ephesians 6. Okay, this, I've uh, got a lot of material to cover. This is about spiritual warfare, like a preemptive spiritual warfare, spiritual defense. And uh, I'm not going to prove all detailed points in the process, but if you want to... Some more info you'd have to ask. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. And let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand this. I pray you'd cleanse us with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray that the Spirit of God would have liberty and that you'd uh, open our eyes and ears. We might understand the spiritual influences around everywhere we go. And I pray you'd help us to know how to be vigilant soldiers. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. Okay, uh, it says, for, we, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Okay, so physical fighting. Okay, we're walking physical, but we're not physically fighting. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to, to the pulling down of strongholds. So the idea of strongholds is that spirits, unclean and clean, can take up residence in a place. This is not superstitious. This is not um, mystical. It's just a fact of life. But there are some weapons in verse 4 that God reveals that you and I can not succumb to strongholds. I get on YouTube and there's like uh, 10 mansions that nobody will buy. And they talk about these buildings being haunted. One, one family bought this one house, thought, ah, it's not true. And then mysteriously has some strange death. So there's some ideas about these things in the Bible. Uh, he says, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Okay, in the Old Testament, God had a Jewish... Uh, theocratic republic where the Jews could physically fight for a physical kingdom. So a lot of people that read the Bible will criticize God about the violence in the Old Testament. And then some uh, unknowledgeable Christians or fake Christians have pulled that idea into the New Testament, like the Salem witch hunt trials. They blame that on Christians. Or the Crusades, they blame that on Christians. That, those not, that's not Christians. Those aren't Bible-believing Christians. The Crusades is Catholic Muslim. Okay, And I think there's a movie called The Kingdom of Heaven. It will be guaranteed to be violent from front to end. Okay, And so Old Testament, because you're dealing with a physical nation, they could physically uh, fight, kill over religion in the New Testament. Uh, the Lord changed the idea. He changed it through the Apostle Paul. In fact, Paul, before he got saved, was named Saul, and he was fulfilling Old Testament ideas of killing heretics, and that's when he met Christ, and Christ said, you're persecuting me. And so then he shifted. He got saved, and then he changed some of the Jewish uh, ideas. They call it Judeo-Christian ethics. There are some similarities, but if you don't know the differences, you're going to really be confused. So we've got to understand the differences. In Ephesians 6, verse 10, uh, Paul sums this up, and he's telling this to a people who worship the god goddess Diana. The goddess Diana is a multi-androgynous uh, uh, type being, uh, they yelled and screamed about it in Acts 19, I think it was. And so that's the society of Ephesus. And so this culture was permeated with the goddess Diana, very much, very much similar to uh, the god Baphomet that is uh, with the Masons. And you find that god, the Baphomet god is an androgynous god. And that's why that's the whole undercurrent of uh, the transgender movement. Okay, that's the whole idea. That's why we're seeing it uh, being manifest itself. Okay, so 
Uh, in the New Testament, uh, the believer is limited to the art of persuasion in witnessing. We are to use words and words only to persuade people to voluntarily come to Jesus Christ. That's the New Testament. Okay, so God gives us spiritual weapons in this age, and if we don't know how to use these spiritual weapons, then we can uh, not be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's where the idea this morning. Uh, Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Okay, that's a mental thing. You put that on. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So this is an armor that we wear. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, principalities might be visible, might not be. Powers, definitely invisible, but may manifest itself in the visible realm. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world, uh, in American culture, sometimes they call that shadow government. Media won't tell you about that. Okay, uh, against spiritual wickedness, that's, that's in a religious realm in high places. You find a lot of that in Rome. Okay, Ephesians 6, 3. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Notice you're not marching, you're just holding your ground. It's like your fort. It's like you have your fort where you're holding your ground, where your soldiers come in, and then they put on the armor, then they go out and be foot soldiers. Verse 14, stand. Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. There are some uh, things in your life, righteous acts, that you must uh, be doing in order to make your warfare more effective. Your feet shy with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching... Watching, standing on your watch, that's being vigilant, being uh, observing things. Watching and praying, two separate entities. One is recognizing the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Okay, this is not a mystical thing. It's not that you wear garlic or something so you can ward off vampires or you got a rabbit's foot in your pocket. It's not superstitious stuff. Down in Rensselaer, we've had, uh, I've noticed uh, the last couple of years that uh, once in a while I see a young person around the building and I say, what are you doing around here? I say, uh, oh, Pokemon, you got something in your gym. Oh, gag me with the spoon. And then about a month ago, there was uh, three or four cars with adult people around our building and I thought, oh, wow, we got a revival on, you know, midweeks or, and they were playing Pokemon in our gym. They catch something in our gym. So I sent a cease and desist order to the Pokemon people. I said, cease and desist trespassing on our property. So I got news back. They've got a stop order. Yeah, it better be. Because that's involving spirits. Okay, and so... Uh, several years ago, when Janet and I was uh, youth pastor, yeah, I was youth pastor down in Colorado Springs. We took some teenagers down to Dallas, Texas, for a youth conference. I'm driving a bus going down I-25. We go through Trinidad, Colorado. Driving through Trinidad, Colorado, just driving through the city, it was like whew, there's some vibes going on here. I could just sense the vibes. You ever get in a situation like that? You could sense some evil. And I just went through and the vibes went away because we got out of the city. And I said, what's going on with Trinidad? And I did a little research maybe a year or so later. I thought about that. I found out that was a sex change capital in America. This was in the 80s. There was a Catholic nun and a Catholic priest that helped him go she and she go he. And that town was infested. Uh, Fort Wayne is unusual. And I discovered just lately, north of Fort Wayne is a very small town that is a pedophil pedophilia center in Indiana. Okay, and so 
Uh, this is not something mystical. It's not I'm going to look under, a, you know, look for a devil under the rock. You know, I'm not going to be superstitious about some things. It's just being vigilant. It's just being vigilant, recognizing hopefully that you can discern. It's a gift in the New Testament called this, the gift of discernment. You ought to pray for it, where you could sense influences of evil and good. And sometimes it will really manifest itself. Okay, it really manifests itself. Go to Bourbon Street down in Mardi Gras. I wouldn't suggest that. You can sense it. Rome, sense it. Washington, D.C., it's almost you could feel it. Okay, and that's just being discernment. So I'm going to give you some thoughts about spiritual warfare, some very practical things. Baptists don't talk about these things because they're kind of scared of it. Um, but... The first thought is this, evil and wicked acts and deception prove the existence of God. That's something to think about. Okay, creation proves the existence of God, but think about this. Uh, when you have something evil, you've got to have a counterpart, something good. Evil reveal, reveals the existence of good. There are polar opposites in life, like light and dark, day and night, right and left. Heaven and hell, male and female. And then the Oriental people will have yin and yang. And they're not wrong about that. There's some truths about that. The yin and yang, they're polar opposites. Most sports will involve two opposing teams. Okay? And they both are told to play by the rules or play within the rules. Okay, most sports are set up like that. Even in wrestling, you may have ten teams at a meet, but two guys are on the mat. There's not ten all schools fighting it out. Okay, and so God has certain parameters for Satan in his role of deception. Now, if we just accidentally evolve through millions of years, why is it that the, quote, conspiracies always put their pyramid up? Or they put their all-seeing eye with their three sixes up. Or they advertise covering one eye, the evil eye. Why do these people do this? Why, why don't they pick uh, 943 for their evil number? Why do they pick 666? Because that is the parameters of the Bible. That's the rules God has laid up. Now, when you have ultimate evil, people don't realize, <clears throat> they don't understand how evil... Uh, the devil is, and of course, you take the word devil, drop D, you got evil, you take the word God, add the O, you got good. And so those are the counterparts as far as the Bible goes. And uh, if you've never experienced some very unusual, dark experiences with devils, uh, I'll kind of show you some things that I've experienced, okay, and, and witnessed, and have witnessed uh, I know a, a good friend of mine committing suicide as a result of dealing with something spiritual that he didn't know what he was doing. It's a very, very important thing. And uh, recognizing how <clears throat> the manifestation of unclean spirits. Most of the time, unclean spirits are manifested by somebody passive. That's the worst case, passive. Their eyes glass over. They can't see, they can't hear. And that can be done with one devil or two devils. <clears throat> and a person needs to recognize these things. Now, I know the charismatics take this to extreme, and the Baptists don't want to talk about it, and that's because a lot of them are infested. But um, <clears throat> many celebrities, why do the celebrities brag about Baphomet and they throw the Baphomet sign up? This isn't peace sign. This is the Baphomet sign, and then they put the two fingers up, and they go like this. Why do they do that? Did that evolve through millions of years? Or does somebody have to follow the rules that God has laid out? There's, it makes no logical sense for somebody to be doing that. And you'll see that over and over and over. The three sixes, the three sixes, they come around to three sixes. Or the devil horns. Now, I know that that could be two outs in baseball. And the Texas Longhorns. <clears throat> but when you see political figureheads going like this, they're paying homage to Baphomet. The androgynous god 
that they have sold their soul to in order to get fame and fortune. Okay, so this is just... I mean, a person has to think about that. If you're not going to consider the creation or the God or the Bible, why don't you try the dark world for a while and see what that's like? I mean, just consider it. good friend of mine, Bill Sneblin, he's gone that route. And he found out Jesus Christ is a Savior. Now, that's a rough route. He took the scenic route. Now, I'm glad I didn't take the scenic route that he took. But uh, why is it in Greek mythology many of the children's fairy tales portray a mixed DNA between man and animals if we just evolved accidentally? Somebody's messing around. And this somebody has a rule, set of rules that God says you have to stay within. And he's going to push the limit. Why do these entities prey on children? You know, in, in nature, you know, if a lion's going to go after a big old grizzly zebra, he's going to go for a, a little colt. Man, that's tender. <laughs> he's going to go for the weakest link. And the devil does the same. We have no clue how evil the nature is of Satan and his ilk. If you study beasts of prey, lions, tigers, bears, Okay, if you study beasts of prey, they will usually attack the prey, get it by the throat, take it out of its misery, and then eat it. But if you study the lesser ones, the devils, not the devil himself, but devils, they, they manifest themselves like flies, mosquitoes, uh, dogs, hyenas. You ever watch a hyena kill an animal? Man, them things are ruthless. They don't go for the throat. They start from the back and eat up. And here you are, here are the animals, they're like the heart's beating, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm three-fourths left, oh, 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 I'm a half left. Why don't you just get to my heart and kill me? But can you imagine the pain that animal goes through? In the Bible, that is portraying devils or unclean spirits. We have a saying, a little birdie told me, okay, or we say he's bird brain, he's got bats in the belfry. Those are all ideas that come from the Bible. The maniac of Gadara. Maybe you've never crossed somebody like that. Okay, but that's some things that, um, it's an amazing thing. And then you'll see some dark people like Adolf Hitler. And the people are going to change the history. Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, it was also known as the pink swastika. The media will tell you that Adolf Hitler was a right wing. He was not a right winger. Ping Swaska, he was a left-wing social activist. That's the side that would soon cut your throat if you don't go with their approval. That's the Mussolini, that's the Franco, that's Adolf Hitler. When Adolf Hitler died in the Spanish newspaper, they printed, Adolf Hitler, the son of the Catholic Church, died defending the faith. Where did the news media not tell us that? They're not going to tell you about church history. And so you got Karl Marx and John Lennon and Stalin, all journalists, and Mussolini. They were all left-wing activists, saying that good is evil and that evil is good. They follow the patterns of the Bible. God has laid up these parameters. So with that knowledge, God has given us some weapons of defense. Now I'm just going to run through some of these. They are very practical things, especially for us parents. But these are weapons of defense that a person can learn to overcome and not succumb to these things. Whenever I get a feeling of lethargy or a passivity amongst myself, you know, I check myself out and wonder, where did I go? You know, I want to get this. Thing. You know, okay, maybe there's a devil or two here or there. And so you got to kind of work on that. So the first thing is, and I probably should reverse these. So I think I'm going to reverse these as I should. The first thing is uh, a person should do is cleanse and sanctify yourself to God. If you would look in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Cleanse and sanctify yourself to God. Okay, sanctify means to set apart, but it's all done by prayer. Uh, I cast my own devils out of me. You say, are you serious? I'm dead serious. Out or off or around, whatever... 
2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Okay, I can figure out the flesh. You know, take a shower or a bath, you stink. What about spiritual? Okay, and perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay, let's try another one. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. We'll slow down and read some of these verses. Luke eleven twenty, and then we'll go to Acts 19. Again, this is not something mystical. It's not something that takes a long time. It's something very dignified. It can just be dealt with and done with, over with, and then uh, maybe have to come back and do it again because there is so much witchcraft and demonology going on around us. Everywhere you go, you can go in a little Walmart and you can pick up a devil. I don't care where you go. Devils are hereditary. Got any witchcraft in your past ground, past or anything like that? Okay, and a person needs to know how to cleanse themselves. So cast out, well, first thing here is I cast my own devils out. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. When a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all that is armor, where he trusted and divided his spoils. Jesus Christ talking. So, what you say, what are you talking about? We cast our own devils, kingdom of God. How do you do that? Finger of God. What's that mean? Well, you got a little fly there, and I can take a finger, and I try to get real close to the fly. <coughs> Personally, I try to grab them and then take their wings off and then put them in there and walk around, you dirty dog, <laughs> dirty fly. Flies, mosquitoes, are evidences or examples of unclean spirits. So if you study flies, mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, parasites, you might learn a little something about the realm of unclean spirits. Unclean spirits can manifest itself in multi-personalities. A maniac of Gadara had one spirit, unclean spirit, but then that spirit said, we are many. So, uh, Mary Magdalene, how many devils did Jesus cast out of her? She had seven. And she's the first one that saw Jesus Christ after the resurrection. Something unique about that lady. Now, I know what Hollywood says about it, but that's a perverted situation. But that tells us that a person can have more than one and can have hundreds. Now, when they get a bunch of them buzzing around their head like the maniac, they're going to be out there. I mean, even Satanists are going to say, they're weird. <laughs> now, that's pretty bad when a Satanist calls somebody weird. And that's what they would say about the werewolves. Yeah, snubless and them werewolves, they're weird. <laughs> they're manifested. That's really infested. Okay, and so we're getting into something different. Look in Acts 19. This is in the Bible, but people just don't want to talk about it. And then the thing is, we, get, we succumb to these things and we don't know about them. Acts 19, verse 13. Okay, uh, the word, uh, as far as taking up residence in place, I'll probably wait for that to the second part, but is haunted. Uh, Acts 19.13, pick up the number, verse 13. It's the only time the word exorcist is found in the Bible. Now, I didn't take time to watch the exorcist movie when I was a teenager. I heard about it. I remember going to karate class, and there was an outdoor movie theater, and as I'm going by, there's the exorcist up on the screen. I saw, goop, and they flashed the devil here, and they flashed another devil there. And then I had heard, I didn't watch the thing. Then I heard she puked up green, and, of course, that's got some significance in the Bible. But where do they get these things? They get it from the Bible. Exorcists, you can't find that in the New Bibles. Why? Because somebody's infested. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, now, notice the switch, though. They took upon them to call... Uh, they had e evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus. They didn't say the Lord Jesus. We adjure you by Jesus. Not good enough. There's another Jesus. You got to say Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, better. 
Okay, and we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches, and there were so, seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? You don't, you're nobody. Get out of here. Get out of my face. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known. Of course it's going to be known. To all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. That's the same place where they had the goddess Diana. Where they yelled for two hours. Great is the goddess of Diana. Did the wave and everything in the Colosseum. Okay, also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on, all, on them all. That's the problem. A lot of people are just afraid of it. But when you got power, you have no reason to be fearful of it. Tremendous power. People say, oh, you talk to a Satanist, you're going to be scared. Pfft. I've talked to several Satanists. I said, why do you work the second best? I got the best. Okay, and so it says, uh, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them which used curious arts brought their books together. They brought Pokemon and Harry Potter, you know, and, you know, the Twilight series. Make sure you get the Twilight series. They brought that in. Okay, and burned them before all men. And when they burned them, I'm sure voices spoke. I'm sure they heard screaming. The spirits leaving. And they counted a price of them and found a 50,000 pieces of silver. Man, they got some money. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So this is not, this is not limited to European culture, even though a friend of mine says he'll be witness to somebody in the house and a picture fall off the wall and something will be shaken on the, de on the table. Okay, this is not something to be admire, you know, to admire. It's not something to be afraid of. This is warfare. And we got a God that can flip them off like a finger. The devils. Nothing to the Lord, nothing. The name of the Lord. There's something, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they have to follow the rules. When that name is brought out, they have to go. They got to go. That's the rules. They are afraid of that. The devils are afraid of that name. Satan himself is not. And so there's power there. Now, if it's an extremely tough case, okay, I knew a young fella that was majorly possessed. I had a friend that was trying to help this guy who was majorly possessed. And I told him, you need to leave him alone. You don't know what you're doing. I said, please leave him alone. And he was adamant about it. And he started acting like that guy. This took less than two months. And he took his life over it. And I told him, you don't know what you're doing. And it's not something to be playing around with. Okay? There are some cases where you, prayer and fasting is necessary. You remember the story in the Bible, Matthew 17, Mark 9, where there's a kid, a little kid, that was majorly possessed. The apostles couldn't get rid of the devils out of the little kid. And Jesus said, they said, why can't we do it? He said, this kind cometh but by prayer and fasting. You know the new Bibles take that verse out? Oh, we get the cross reference. Mark 9, 29. Wonderful way. We got the cross reference. Yeah, they take out and fasting in the cross reference. Because there's times that you're dealing with something more powerful than what normal. And so that you got to really get close to God on these things. And prayer and fasting is necessary in some of those cases. Okay, so uh, in this case, number one, cleanse yourself. Cast out your own devils. Number two, purge your conscience with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the prayer for cleansing in, uh, for yourself, I have something in a footnote of 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, which would work pretty fine. Uh, <clears throat> the blood of Jesus Christ will work pretty good, too, but sometimes you've got to kind of get more detailed. But this one, purge your conscience with the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living Christ? Have you ever got down to pray? And all of a sudden, a wicked thought comes in your mind. And you're thinking, man, I'm trying to pray. And why is this coming through my head? Well, what I do right on the spot, Lord, please cleanse me with the shed blood of Christ. Soak me in his blood. And poof, 
it goes away. That's what the blood of Christ can do. Okay? And, I mean, if, if you get the blood of Christ when a mosquito bites you, he's going to go away singing, there's power in the blood. <laughs> and so he's going to be out of there, that's for sure. Okay, but uh, that's very important. You need to strengthen your soul in the Word of God, Ephesians 6. Enough said on that. How about music? You need to play some godly and spiritual music in your house and your car. No music is amoral. All music is spiritual, either evil or, uh, or good. All music is, no matter what. It, you're stepping into a spiritual realm with music. When a person gets into the music, they are becoming one with the composer and the art, the, the person playing the music, the band, and those bands will tell you, in many cases, we have prayed to Satan, sold our soul, because we want him to bless our work. And when a kid gets into that, they're getting into the spirits. I mean, it's, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 16, when Saul was possessed with devils, David played the harp, and the spirits were repelled. And so, all music has a spiritual application to it. No music is amoral, and a person needs to stand again. He needs to turn it off. Now, I know us men, we can block it out. You know, we can get in our nothing box and not, not hear anything. Okay, but still, it does desensitize us. Okay, this is still cleansing yourself. Cleansing yourself. Uh, resist the spiritual pressure. James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist it. Now, when you lose that desire for resistance, that's when you really got to cleanse yourself. Okay, now let's go back to the, the house. I should have done this earlier. Okay, so the first one is uh, cleanse yourself and sanctify yourself. The second one is cleanse your place and sanctify it. Okay, your house. Okay, here we are 6,000 years from Adam. Uh, do you have any evidence that somebody wasn't murdered on your property? What does the Bible say if somebody's been murdered and uh, and the justice hasn't taken place on their blood? What does it say in, in Nehemiah, uh, Numbers chapter 33? It says that their blood's crying out. Uh, do you know uh, the past 6,000 years there wasn't a witch that set up residence in your place? You don't know. You just don't know. So the thing is, is just play it safe and cleanse it. Okay? And again, the devil can take up residence. Uh, down in Rensselaer, there's a family in their house that said that there's something in our house. We've never seen it, but we could feel it on occasion. And it actually will brush up against us. It actually push in our skin. And we think they get it cool. Yeah, not until... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and so we need to cleanse our house. Brent and Jen was in our basement. They stayed over one time, and they, they both Brent and Jen ran upstairs and said, uh, Dad, when was the last time you cleaned the house? Well, uh, I haven't prayed over for a while. They said, uh, we were down in bed, and we saw, we heard something walk from this room to that room. Can hear it. I said, okay. So I just go downstairs, and you'll find a prayer in Nehemiah chapter 13, footnote. And I start in the bottom room, and I go to this room, go to that room, this room, go upstairs, go to, you know, I, Bill Snevelin taught me, you know, start at the farthest end, walk them out the door. Now, I know they can go out the door, they can go out the windows, they can go out anywhere. And I think you can do it real quick, uh, but just to kind of be thorough, so I just cleanse the house and sanctify my house for God. God told Moses before he gave him the Ten Commandments, Exodus 19.23, sanctify the mountain. Why? God says, if I'm going to dwell there, I want it clean. Exodus 19.23. So, it is something. uh, In Ephesians 5.26, it says, uh, washing of the water by the word, sanctify and cleanse the church. Um, In Ezekiel 26.17, it talks about a place being haunted. In Ezekiel 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, seven chapters in a row about the devil. Okay, if uh, if you the Disney, pretend Disney castle, the original is over there in southern Germany. I went to it. 666 etched in the walls. The fallen cherub in the cafeteria. The person who designed that designed a mysterious death. 
very mysterious death. This is not something that people play with. It's not something you have to be afraid of because you got your armor. Nothing to be afraid of because, man, we're worshiping the king. Okay, but still, we need to recognize some of these things. Okay, we can stand true to it. Okay, Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. That's one sentence. It's two verses, one sentence. With that implication is, has there been angry words uttered in your house? And it hasn't been taken care of. Just the other day, we were passing, doing the door hanging things over here. David, David was in the back of the car. David was with me, David Ferry. And we were driving down the road, and there's this guy looking in this car, just going like that at that, yelling and screaming. And we drove by it, and just driving by that spirit, it was like, whoa. There's some power manifested here. Now, David kind of knew some of the history going on there, but you could just sense it. You know, you see somebody like that, you almost want to walk over to him and tap him on the shoulder. You know, you will look funny when you get mad. But I don't think they'd appreciate that. But has there been anger, angry words uttered in your house? You just kick that door wide open for devils just to come on in. And the thing is, boot them back out. Boot them back out. The prayer for that I put in Nehemiah 13. When you travel and go from motel to motel, how do you know what went in a room in that? How do you want to say on in that room? Or down in Rensselaer in the public school, they look in the mirror and they go, oh, 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 and then all of a sudden a light comes out. You see, those are, those are things that a person has to understand. This is not uh, an evolutionary process. This is evil manifesting itself. Okay, so you can cleanse your place and sanctify it for God. Play some good godly music in your house. Uh, if your children are small and you have the Bible on audio, audio CD while they're playing in the room, if you want to teach them to learn to play by themselves, which is a good thing to do to teach a child to be a loner so they play by themselves, you say, well, they'll scream. Let them scream for a while. They'll, they'll figure it out. You're exercising their lungs. It's good for them. And they'll figure out, hey, this ain't working. I'll go play. And they'll go play. And have some CD music or uh, some Bible being played so that that spirit comes out, gets into their subconscious. Okay, so uh, cleanse the place and cleanse it for God. Now, we parents, for our children, here's a great blessing, okay? Job 1, verse 5, if you would. Job 1, verse 5. I'd say Mr. Job uh, was a um, pretty good example, Mr. Job. Uh, he beat the devil. He overcame the devil. You say, yeah, but he didn't do so hot later on. Yeah, but that was his friends. His friends got him to do something the devil could not get him to do. Now, here's what he did. Job 1, verse 5. His children, probably adult children at the time or whatever, had a get-together, had a family get-together, probably a birthday party in verse 4. Okay, and in verse 5 it says, And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them by prayer. Your children. Rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. So under his religious setting, that's what he was to do to get a hold of God. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So parents, we need to pray continually for our kids. Grandparents, we need to pray continually. The pressure put on this generation is unbelievable. Okay, and so verse 6. Verse 6, 7, and 8, the devil uh, shows up in heaven. He has a certain parameters that God says you have to operate within. You, you're not going to get outside of these parameters, okay, without my approval. And, and God picked a fight. God said, hey, Apollyon, Leviathan, whatever you want to call yourself today. Have you ever considered Job? Oh, why'd you bring up that guy? 
Why'd you do that for? Oh, I just kind of wanted to give you a black eye. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschewth evil? And Satan answered, the Lord said, He's not, he's not afraid. It's just like a smart mouth, social justice warrior, who's never earned to work the day in his life. But he says, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. There's some type of a hedge or protection put around him. Okay, and I think it's something that we could pray for. A hedge of protection. We have a hedge of protection, say, in our permanent abode and then... As we leave the spiritual fort, we go out into the world, we have our armor of God on. And then we stay in touch with the commander-in-chief. So I do believe there's something there that we can spiritually pray over our children or pray for them. Okay, And then this would be like a shield about them Okay, and help them out. Another thing is, is Psalm 91. I don't know if you've, uh, I had it memorized at one time, but the 61-year-old gears are kind of slipping here and there. And uh, Psalm 91 is something very interesting. And when the arch enemy of Jesus Christ quotes or misquotes a certain select passage to deceive Christ, go back to the passage and there's something in there. And it's Psalm 91. Often known to be Psalm of Protection. A colonel in World War I, Colonel Whittingly, I think it was his name, had Psalm 91 put on a little card. And he gave it to his soldiers in the 91st Infantry Brigade. And they were preparing for combat in Europe. Most of the men were green soldiers who had never seen combat. Its commander, a devout Christian, called an assembly of his men when he gave each of them a little card on which was printed the 91st Psalm. They agreed to recite the psalm daily. The 91st Brigade was engaged in three of the bloodiest battles of World War I. While other American units similarly engaged had up to 90% casualties, the 91st Brigade did not suffer a single combat-related casualty. Okay, and I would say that gives credit not to their great military strategy. I mean, if you read some of them great army men in the Old Testament, Joshua and David, and when God told them, here's the military plan, they probably said, are you kidding? A trumpet? With Gideon, a trumpet? A pitcher? A light? What are you, nuts? It's like the kid, when, when he came home from Sunday school class, his mom said, Mom, or his mom said, what would you learn in Sunday school? Oh, I learned about Moses. Oh, what you learn? Well, when he was getting ready to cross the Red Sea, he got these airplanes and he flew over to the other side. And he had these army tanks and he just bombed the Egyptians, you know, to smithereens. She said, did you learn that in Sunday school class? He said, no, but Mom, if you'd heard the real story, you'd never believe what I just told you. <laughs> I mean, that's a fact of that. Some of the things the Lord told those men to do, you've got to be kidding. But when God calls the shots, he wants to manifest his power. And so, as a parent, we can pray a hedge of thorns of protection, soak it in the blood of Christ. I'd put a doubly thing on that. And we can pray uh, some... Weapons that the Lord has given us so that we do not succumb to the wiles of the devil. It's more prevalent than you know. I believe that every unsaved person has at least one, like a guardian angel, a guardian devil. And when you hit the hot topic, you might see a reaction, usually a passive where the eyes glass over. Okay, if they got more than that, like Mary Magdalene, 
or if they got bunches of them, then you're going to see some really abnormal behavior. And are we not seeing abnormal behavior in people these days? I mean, when you, when you see a guy where he's got his hair up like a point like this, and you're looking at him, you say, what are you looking at? I'm going to say, you! What do you want to do? Evolve from a unicorn or something? I don't know. I'm trying to figure you out. I mean, that's just not natural. Okay? And so the thing is, is that... Um, the Lord has given us spiritual weapons that we can, we have at our availability. And the mighty power of God is amazing. And it's not something that, it's mystical, it's not that I'm going to wear my rabbit's foot. No, it's not in my pocket. No. Let me check, no, I don't got my rabbit's foot. <laughs> if I'm going to get one rabbit's foot, I'm killing the whole rabbit and going to carry the thing. Put a Daniel Boone hat, whole rabbit, if you think that's going to work. I mean, it's the blood of Christ that's available. The name of Jesus Christ is powerful. It is a non-negotiable name when used. Non-negotiable. They don't have a choice in the matter. That's, and when you know that, why would you go to the losing side? If you can't beat him, join him. He's on the winning side. Man, there's nothing better than that. And he wants us to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to see that these weapons are available. But so many, so many, so many uh, where we kick the door open, allow them to come in, and we wonder, why why am I so discouraged, depressed? Well, Lord, help us to live above the circumstances rather than below the circumstances by being soldiers of Jesus Christ. Help us to recognize as parents and grandparents that we need to be praying for our children and grandchildren. And we need to cover them in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, soak them in the name of Jesus Christ, sanctify them, sanctify ourselves so that uh, we could... uh, be a good soldier to stand against the wiles of the devil. The piano will play. If you'd like to use the altar, it's open for you. If you would, uh, grab your hymn book and let's sing that 288. We'll just sing that 288.